Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, David Pruitt and Lori Northrup and Marty for inviting me here today. It's indeed an honor to be with you. And I would like to say you're to be congratulated, each one of you, for your courage and your persistence in the ongoing effort to stop soaring. You are the ones who have done the heavy lifting. You've carried the water and broken up the ground, and you're the ones who have endured the, I would say, the personal abuse by those who I would deem afraid of the truth. Most importantly, because of your efforts, there is a new and a sound market for the Tennessee walking horse beyond the narrow confines of the pads and chains. Now that market has grown to encompass nationally and internationally 90% of the walking horse industry. So from the bottom of my heart, I say thank you for making a difference. There is now a light at the end of a long dark tunnel and I would say a new era in this great breed has begun. I've been asked to share my journey uh, since publicly uh, taking a, a stand against the practice of soaring some 13 years ago, about 1998, you do the math. I'm just one, though, of many who have spoken in the past about the problem of soaring. Some of you are here today who have, have done that, too. And we could spend hours recalling names of those who had enough, who said enough's enough uh, to the immoral training practices that go on in the Tennessee walking horse industry. But those who got marginalized, got defamed, got slandered for their stand, who are now no longer in the industry, they're out. In fact, the walking horse industry is littered, the highway is littered with those casualties. The beginning of the end for me began Easter Sunday, April the 12th, 1998. It was the day before my 45th birthday, so you can do the math. And let me just give you a brief backdrop to that, that day. At that time, I was managing Harlandsdale Farm. The industry was robust. I was the... Uh, senior uh, vice president of the Breeders Association. I was also serving on the commission. And the trainers at that time had their annual trainer show in March, as you're aware of. And it, you, at that time was a rather large show. And the USDA showed up in full force to uh, take people through the inspection process instead of just the uh, HIOs. Well, the trainers decided that um, they were going to boycott their own show. A logic that still mystifies me to this day. I, I do not understand that. I still don't today, and nobody's ever really quite explained it. But to me, it was like sending up a red flag and say, uh, we're guilty, come, come interview us. When you boycott your own show. And so we didn't have a show, and so I was home that uh, weekend. I believe that was a weekend before Easter. And I was doing what I normally like to do. I was sitting on my back deck. It was a pretty afternoon, and I love to read. It's one of my hobbies. And I have a reading plan I've been doing for almost 40 years now, and, and it's where it takes me through the Scriptures continuously. And that very afternoon, I was, I'm a teacher, so I was reading the book of Esther. Some of you may be familiar with that story. It was about a, a young Jewish woman who was very beautiful, became the queen of Persia. The king did not know she was Jewish. And there was a man named Haman who would travel every day back and forth to the king. He was one of his officials. He became upset because there was a man named Mordecai who would not bow down to him. And so he became enraged at all, that found out he was Jewish, and enraged at all the Jews, and decided that he would get the king to pass a law that they would annihilate all Jews in Persia, which at that time encompassed most of the Middle East. So the king consented, and uh, there was an edict that all the Jews were to be killed. Well, Mordecai, who happened to be Esther's uncle, 
sent word to her saying, you got to go do something. you got to speak to the king. And she sent word back. She said, nobody goes to the king, and if you go to the king without being invited, he'll kill you. So the king spoke back these words to her. Do you think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape? For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family, father's family, will perish. And who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. That was the very place I was reading when my wife came out on the deck. And she said, Clay, there's somebody from the Tennessee and they want to talk to you. I thought, well, okay. So it was Jay Hamburg with the Tennessean, and uh, of course, you know, uh, bo trainers boycotted their own show, and he was trying to figure out the same logic I was. So he was saying, you know, what's the deal? Well, what's going on in the industry? Why have they shut their show down? I can't get anybody to talk to me. Will you talk to me? And I said, yeah, I will. And these are the words I had, and I'll let you judge if they were too harsh or unfair. Now, they're chopped up because I pulled them, extracted them out of the article. But the title of the article, front page of the Nashville, Tennessee, and back then we didn't have internet, so that was a, still a pretty good circulating newspaper. It said, Horseman says it's gut check time. I said, we're at a crossroads. Somebody's got to do something and do it now, or this is going to get out of hand. And we're going to lose everything that we've built. Everybody's caught in a maddening cycle. The trainer has to eat. He doesn't want to lose his customer. He has to win a show. Someone, somewhere, we've got to stop and reevaluate all at the same time. Everybody is in denial. It's just like, don't tell me the truth. I like the lie. I'd rather live the lie. And if you tell them the truth, they're going to hate me. But I just decided, I said my father decided, and all my family decided, enough is enough. We've got a choice of self-regulation. Either we're going to do it or we're going to have it done for us. The USDA is not playing around. And I went on to say that the industry's troubles had hurt the industry's reputation for decades. And it has, still has today. We couldn't even get anybody to be a master of ceremonies at the celebration at that time because of the implications. Concluding with, I'm not out to hurt anybody, and I'm still not today. These are good people, and I still believe that today in a lot of ways, and good families, and they've gotten stuck in a way of doing things. And sometimes maybe a little waking up helps us all. We sort of brought this on ourselves. That's all I said. You would have thought I'd said Adolf Hitler was a saint like Mother Teresa. <laughs> and speaking in the newspaper is not a decision I do not regret. But it has been a journey that I t was totally not prepared for. Nor do I want anyone's sympathy for my trials. I believe trials are good for us. They make us stronger. And today I'm free to speak the truth about soaring, and I'm a happy man. And God has richly blessed me. I have, my wife and I will be married uh, 40 years uh, this November. I have three beautiful children and four grandsons. So the uh, horse industry still has some future there with the Harlan family. But if someone had told me this time last year that I would be speaking at this convention or any horse convention, I would have asked them what dope they had been smoking. <laughs> because that was a chapter in my life, even though my father is still in the business, that I had written off, I'd closed that chapter, I'd sealed it away. And, <clears throat> Till today, <laughs> it 
in the recesses of my mind. But since 2000, I had not even the slightest fantasy of ever entering this arena again. Excuse me. Yeah, I'll be there in a minute. Excuse me. What I, uh, what I once loved had become a uh, very dark and painful memory. As you can see, I've kind of untapped a little of that today. For some of you who may not know, I grew up in the walking horse industry. It was in my DNA, in my blood. The smell of a good horse was something I liked. I can, my wife could remember whenever we'd go to visit maybe even a zoo, I would take a big whiff and I'd say, boy, this smells good. You know, I just like animals. I like being around them. My family, as you know, loves them. It was the overriding passion of my life. I, I, I lived and breathed the Tennessee walking horses. I'm a third generation of Harlan's in the walking horse industry. My grandfather and my hero in 1935 was there in Lewisburg for the formation of the TWHA. My father was with him as a young man. My grandfather always said the walking horse business began in a courthouse and it will probably always be there. I grew up under the tutelage of great horsemen. My grandfather, as I said, Ward Harlan, Harlan Hayes, my father Bill Harlan, and current manager of the farm, my good friend and associate, Rocky Jones. I had the privilege of seeing the great sires of the breed up close and very personal. Midnight Sun, Sun's Delight, Spirit of Midnight, Midnight Mackay, Pride of Midnight, Pride's Gold Coin, and the list goes on. And even though they've been relegated to padded horse sires, they were some of the most natural horses I'd ever seen. And many of the great brood mares were under are still on our farm, but if you if you would like to buy one, my father's here today, he'd probably sell you a few. <laughs> a gift that goes back to 1935. And Faye, I'll get through this today. And all my children will testify. I could have practiced that I wouldn't get this way. Uh, will testify that I gave my life, my blood, my sweat, and my tears to the horse industry. And when I walked away in 2000, it literally took everything from me, financially, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. But like so many who grew up in the industry, especially in Tennessee, you grow accustomed to the abuse. Exposure to most anything in life breeds a tolerance for it, an ind ind indifference to it. Soaring was just part of the industry. And like the rest, I spoke the industry propaganda and I turned a blind eye when needed to stay in the good graces of the industry because I'd seen what they do to people who speak the truth. Truthfully, when anyone remains silent while knowing an abuse is happening, they are complicit. That's true with anything in life. Cowardice and apathy are not virtues. I'm a pastor, and by law, I have to report abuse, physical abuse or sexual abuse when it is made known to me. And if you want to stop soaring, then apply the rule to the, this, that same rule to this industry. Any farrier, veterinarian, owner who knowingly, willfully commits, perpetrates, masks over, and shows an abused Tennessee walking horse should be prosecuted along with a trainer. Let me be very clear. 
I don't come today in an air of self-righteousness. Even though I never trained a horse under saddle, I know the pressures of walking, and walking, working in a horse industry. We would have some 300 mares come through our facility in the summertime. We would have on the neighborhood of 50 yearlings to break in a couple of months. And I've done my share of abuse. And I'm not proud of it, but I don't come self-righteously before you. The decision to finally come to the realization of truth about the issue of soaring was a process for me, much like Dr. Hafner said. For me, that process is seen through the lens of my view of life or my worldview. In an event like this, you may think that it's out of place, but I testify to it because it is my story, and I can't divorce myself from my story. Since 1973, I have been a follower of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't believe truth is abstract or an evolving concept like some say today. Truth has an origin. It's a person. And he is someone you come to know. And when you follow him, he will lead you into all truth. And that truth can be very liberating. My worldview or the lens through which I filter life is through His Word. The reason for my decision to be honest about soaring and abuse of this great breed is directly related to my love for God and no other reason. Realizing for some of you the reasons may be totally different. And that's okay. We all came to the same conclusion. That being said, maybe it will help you in understanding the rest of my story. As I said, I served on the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Board of Directors for many years. I served on the Executive Committee. Some of you are here today. I think I saw Cheryl back there. We served together on the Executive Committee, primarily under the Breeders Division. I also served on the Walking Horse Commission, and that was quite an experience to sit on the board that judged the trainers who had the uh, violations against them. We had implemented many new standards to bring integrity to the breed registry. The membership had doubled in response to the sound policies that we had put into place. We went from 10,000 members in a short period of time to 21,000 members during that time. It was robust in 1998. The economy was good, horse sales were good. And also as a board, we were working on judging standards and licensing of judges. We even came out with a video determining degrees of lameness so a judge could excuse them. If they saw them in a ring, Don Bell and Dr. Dave Whitaker helped put that together. But that was when the heavy hand of the, and somebody else coined this, I've used it many times, but it's the redneck mafia began to surface. Don Bell was immediately fired. And that program was canned. And then things began to slide backwards from that point on. And that was in 1998. Also as a board, we were it cleaned up everything that we could think of that was corrupt in our, in, in our board industry or in, our, or in the TWHBA or, the, or in the industry except for soaring, and that wasn't going to go away. It still plagued the industry, and so it was becoming apparent to me as a person and frustrating that no one really wanted to clean up soaring. The majority of the leaders were trying to keep soaring contained and appear respectable. But it was obvious that the industry was never going to grow past it. And I was disillusioned that no one could see the potential for the growth based on a sound industry. And it was during that time in April of 1998 that I had had enough of the lies. And the newspaper contacted me and I thought it was time to take a lead because no one else was. But the backlash from my decision was far more than I could ever have calculated would happen. Overnight, I went from the top to the bottom, from friend to foe, and I was on the outside looking in. In time, other horses, well, 
Harlandsdale went from the top of the breeding industry to that time to a byword with a threat of boycotts. I was told that personally by one of the stallion owners. We lost many of our world's champions because of my statements in the newspaper. My father and I were talking about the other day. One of them looked at me directly in front of all our employees and dressed me down. Asked me to recant what I had said in the newspaper. I said I couldn't. And he moved his horse. In time, other horses replaced those we lost, but the damage was done, mostly inside me. I continued on with the farm for about a year and a half before I finally got out completely. I was broken. I was bitter. I was disillusioned with the Tennessee walking horse industry. The practice of abuse just got worse and bolder. I saw no hope as long as it was in the grip of the TWHBEA and the Trainers Association. And I knew unless the federal government stepped in, we were incapable of self-regulation. And nor was anyone serious about stopping the abuse. And the trainers held it hostage, and they still do today. Public perception would eventually turn on this great breed because of the abuse, and it has. There's too much convenient technology to keep it hidden anymore. The practice of abuse is necessary for the big lick performance. And I don't need any proof. I know. I saw it. And you know I'm right. And I could prove it today. And I'm grateful for the undercover work that has brought it to light. And those are not just a few bad apples. They were doing what they had to do to survive in the padded horse industry. So I started life over at 46, nearly 47. I sold every horse I had. I wanted out. I didn't want any part of it. My son and my son-in-law both in the military. And I knew my son, who's a top gun pilot, flies F-18s off of aircraft carriers, that he would have to have government clearance one day, and I didn't want anything taking his record. And I made sure he had nothing to do with it either. I wanted away from it. As far away as I could get. My family had a small interest in industrial laundry service in Tullahoma, and it had burned to the ground during this, process, during this time. And they'd rebuilt the plant, a beautiful plant, but they had overspent their money, and they were feeling the debt. Morale was low, and among the employees and the business was falling off, and I had had experience in that industry, and they had hired me to go and try to resurrect that business for the rest of the owners. So I went from the frying pan to the fire. My daily round trip was 114 miles through the heart of Tennessee walking horse country. I had to drive past the barns of those I had grown to hate. My life was full of bitterness and anger for what they had done to the industry. I had gotten a Facebook post the other day, somebody saying, why did my father and myself throw the industry under the bus? I wrote back kindly, but I just said, you need to do the arithmetic. It's been 10% of the industry that's been dragging the rest of the industry under the bus for a long time. But that is where the healing began to take place for me. God and I got to know each other very well during those long drives to and from work. And God cleaned me out of all my bitterness, and he's still working on me today. I remember I had a legal page list of all my enemies, and God had me write their names down and pray for them every day until I could love them. He showed me how to forgive and love my enemies, which is a daily process. I also saw the industry from the outside 
for the first time and just how small the padded horse really was, what the general publicly, public actually thought about the abuse with pads and chains, and I was glad to be out of the padded insanity. And I saw that just a very few had the industry by the throat. By March of 2005, we were able to resurrect the business in Tullahoma and sold it to Unifirst, and I was out of a job once again. But God opened a door for me to serve in another one of my passions. I studied to be in the ministry in, in David Lipscomb. I never went into it officially. I'd always taught all my life. I'd been an elder at many churches. And I was hired to be put on staff in the, where I attended church just two miles over the hill here at New Hope Community Church. And there I teach, preach, and organize adult education and lead people in mission trips and locally and abroad. And if you weren't, didn't have your activities tomorrow, I'd ask you to come tomorrow to our service. I will be preaching. But it's been an exciting adventure, and it's taken me all over the world. Made numerous trips to Haiti, to Honduras, to Romania, to Ukraine, and to India. I currently have a radio show, and I guess God's got a sense of humor. I, I uh, have a show called From the Heart on WROL AM 950 in Boston. Five days a week, goes out to four million people in New England. So they listen to this country boy talk. <laughs> There's never a dull moment when you follow the Lord. And that brings me up to last summer to when I met Marty Irvy. Almost every Thursday, my son's father-in-law and I have been getting together for coffee prior to them getting married and for the many years afterwards. So we pray for them, and we pray for uh, the rest of our family members. We've been doing that faithfully. And one of those mornings last, uh, last summer, he dropped a newspaper article in front of me, and he said, deja vu. I opened it up, and there was a picture of Marty Irby on the front. said, past president of the Breeder Association takes a stand against soaring. I scanned it, folded it back up, slid it back to him. I said, I know what he's getting ready to go through. <laughs> I changed the subject. I moved on. I didn't want to talk about it. A few days later, I was taking a Friday off as pastors have to pick your days off. I was cutting my grass, and uh, as many times I do cutting grass, it's the one time I can kind of clear my head and think about things, and Marty kept coming to mind. And I knew as I've, those of you walk with the Lord, you just you develop a relationship, and you realize certain thoughts come to your mind. They're not just certain thoughts. There's something he's speaking. So I began to pray for Marty and my thoughts and thinking about him and what he was going through and had to open that light box of memories and start thinking about all that stuff. And I finished my cutting my grass and I got ready to ride my new horse, which is a motorcycle, and uh, take it out for a little ride. And I'm just about to get out of the house and the phone rang. I thought, oh, man, I can't get out of the house. And I looked down. I didn't recognize the number. I said, but, you know, as a pastor, you, you got to take it. And so I picked, I answered the phone, and it was Marty. He said, hey, Clay, this is Marty Irby. I think you'll remember I said I've been expecting your call. <laughs> he said, I found you on the Internet. And I said, yeah. I said, I bet I know what you're going through. He said, yeah, life's pretty hard right now. So he came to hear me preach that Sunday. And he's come back a few times, and we've developed a relationship. He's like a son to me, and I've been able to guide him through his journey, which I could almost predict it and make a road map from him, for him when he calls me. I've been able to help Marty by encouraging him against the personal attacks because that's their M.O. That seemed to be the padded horse industry's only defense to slander someone's character. And I helped him learn not to retaliate and to pray for his enemies, which we kind of help each other sometimes now. Also, to stay objective and stick to the main goal and not get off into the side petty issues. Marty told me about Congressman Ed Whitfield and the PAST Act, and at first I was reluctant to say anything publicly or even get involved because of my past and my position at church. But Marty was going to put his neck out on the line, so would I. I couldn't let him go alone. 
and I wrote Congressman Ed Whitfield in support of the PAST Act. Also, I had about an hour meeting sometime later with Congressman, Congresswoman Blackburn with no positive results. I have a lot of respect for her in Tennessee. We don't pay an income tax in the state of Tennessee because of her. She's done a lot of good things. And I was really bothered by the fact that she would come out in support of her bill and not support the PAST Act. And I was really concerned about her reputation as a friend and as a pastor. I, I met with her. And I pleaded with her. I said, you know, you don't want to be known for the very person who could have ended soaring in the walking horse industry, and you didn't. But she did. And I don't know whether it's, she's naive, doesn't understand what's at stake here. I tried to explain it. She was talking about it's going to kill the industry. I said, no, it's not. It's just going to kill 10%, 90%. It's very healthy. It's just not right here. But I said it can be reborn. And there is hope for it. And she showed me her bill, and I said, this is just the fox watching the hen house. It's more of the same. And she, did, she decided to not listen to me, and we ended our meeting. But I wanted to uh, say that I'm very disappointed in the Tennessee delegation of congressmen and senators other than Senator Cohen, who I'm not a big fan of, but I've become one. We're on different sides of worldviews. But I'm very proud of the fact that he stood up and said, this is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. I don't care who sponsors it. And I don't know about you, I'm so sick and tired of <laughs> nothing ever being done anyway. I don't have any fantasies about the past act. My hope and my courage for the future is right here. You guys, what you are doing. I hope the past act passes. But that won't change, as Dr. Hafner said, a, a human heart. You can make all the laws in your world, but you can't change a human heart. It's bent on doing harm to another animal, to an animal, period, or a person. So let me give you some suggestions as I leave. I probably talk too long. I'm a pastor. I do that anyway. Let me give you some, ob some, some things that I've seen to conclude with that uh, outside looking in. But it's time to starve the beast and let it die. What do I mean by that? My father and my grandfather and myself, we've all been big proponents of the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Association. We've given everything, money, time, you name it. Only to be, feel like we get kicked in the teeth. But they do not have the sound horse industry's best interest at heart. And so it's time for us to, I guess you would say, grant them the divorce and give them the house. Give them the furnishings. Stop the fighting. Stop financially supporting a padded horse industry and its abuses and its negative interests. And under the current tired leadership, it will eventually die. So let them go their own way. Anything built on a lie will eventually crumble under the weight of that lie, and that's true in anything in life, and you know it's true. The public has already begun to become aware, and it will only continue. And you can go to the bank. that it, The abuse will not stop with the padded horse industry. They cannot do the big lick without pain, and the soaring will continue. So it's time. It's time to start a new breed registry with a fresh, clean, positive direction. The sound product is working. It's growing outside of this area of the padded industry. Build on it. Have your own breed conventions in different cities and venues and markets. Crown your own champion. Create a new criteria. 
for this talented horse to display their potential and their worth. The celebration is not the breed show. It's a private show. And it's fading. And their champions mean nothing anymore. They don't to me. They had to me for many years. So why don't you crown your own? Why don't you start your own registry? I've understood that there's one that started. I like the initials WWH. That's my father's initials and my grandfather's. <laughs> it's a good way to start. <laughs> my grandfather would like that. I know my dad's laughing back there. He did not lack for confidence. But there are some other big obstacles in their way. And it's not paths and chains. It's each of you. It's time to unify all light shod groups. And I know this much about what's going on in the politics of the industry, even among light shod people. You know why I know that? Because I'm a pastor. And unity is a difficult, difficult, difficult task for human beings. But if you want to grow, if you want this thing, this 90% to grow, then come together and do it. Quit wasting your time on subjectivity and in a defense posture. You're going to get attacked. You're going to get slandered. Your character is going to get maligned. But it doesn't matter. You've got a product that you don't have to hire a PR firm to put a happy face on. Because it's clean. <laughs> but don't remain in a defense posture. Rather, go on offense and move forward by giving the buying public a clear choice and watch, and, and which can only be done by having a new breed registry and a new image, and focus on the truth. And what is positive in this great breed is a good friend and mentor. Dr. Neil Anderson says, we're not called to stamp out the darkness. We're called to turn on the light. So turn on the lights. Keep them on. Keep them bright. And when you do, the darkness scatters. I'm sorry if I went over a little bit. Like I said, I'm a pastor. We do that. Watches mean nothing to us. But thank you again for your kindness and this invitation to speak to you for putting up with my Tears that goes with my DNA and my genes. I can't get away from that sometimes, but thank you. And may God richly bless you and your efforts. Thank you.